Listen for a word from God. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, she will guide you into all the truth, for she will not speak on her own, but will speak whatever she hears, and she will declare to you the things that are to come. She will glorify me, because she will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that she will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. I pray that you will illuminate the way even now. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we celebrated the birthday of the church, marked by the gift of the Holy Spirit. On that first Pentecost, the Spirit of God came down like a rushing wind and like tongues of fire sitting on top of the people's heads. It's my symbol for this tongue of fire. Today, we continue to celebrate the gift of the Spirit, for this is Trinity Sunday in our liturgical calendar. The Trinity, commonly known as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here at Middle, we also say God the Mother. We sing about the Trinity in our hymns, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You will hear the language of Trinity in our baptism liturgy and in our communion. The Trinity is what makes traditional Christianity Unique among all the other religions. Unique, but not special. In the tradition in which I was raised as a child and youth, I vaguely remember being told about the Trinity in Sunday school. I remember the images that they gave me. The Trinity is like, you know, water. It's you know, frozen, liquid, and gas, steam. Or the Trinity is like an egg. It's got the shell, the white, and then the yolk. One, still an egg, one, and that was God. That's the Trinity. (sighs) In the tradition in which I grew up, we didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit, except by egg and water. We talked to all Jesus all the time. And we would throw in a little bit of God as Father for good measure, or if the preacher wanted to make a point about how mad God was with you. The the Spirit was referred to, it was called the Holy Ghost. I grew up Baptist in the South. It's the Holy Ghost. Now, as a young person, this image frightened me because ghosts were scary. They were dead people who weren't very happy. (laughs) And they usually weren't very nice either. And for me, I was thinking about poltergeist, right? You know, they're here. It's like the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is here. My time at seminary didn't seem to um, help with understanding of the Trinity much either. All my professors referred to the Trinity as a mystery and something just to accept on faith. I left seminary still very confused about what exactly the Trinity was or was supposed to do. It wasn't until much later in my faith journey that I, that I began to get the beauty of the Trinity as what's called a perichoresis, perichoresis, a dance of love between God, Jesus, and the Spirit. The Spirit is the advocate and comforter that Jesus said he would leave with us. And the Spirit, and this is when I finally got it, is the Spirit of Jesus, who is God. Jesus, a radical man of love who fed the poor, healed the sick, and was on the side of the downtrodden and oppressed. This this Spirit was not a scary, spectral haunting who was going to hurt you but a person who would always be with us when Jesus was gone. This comforter would be our friend and speak the truth for our lives. 
In understanding the Trinity as a dance of love, I began to see that the God who created the world is also the God who has redeemed and is redeeming the world in Jesus the Christ and who sustains the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are not three gods. The egg kind of makes it like three gods, and so does the water. It's called modalism. That's my big theological word for the day, modalism. Three gods. But there's one God and three persons, each with a unique nature, and every act of God uniquely involves each person in the Trinity. Making sense? Great. This one God was the same God who hovered over the waters of chaos at creation, who spoke the divine word and caused things to be, who breathed the divine ruach or breath into the first earthling, who played in the garden and gave wisdom to kings and nations, the one who made the covenants with Israel and the one who fulfilled the covenants with all of humanity in the incarnation, life, and ministry of Jesus. All of these acts involve the Trinity. One God, three persons, unique in their acts. Our scripture text for today gives us some further insight into understanding who the Trinity is, for as my colleague Chad reminded me earlier in the week, it is... um, the view of the Trinity from one person of the Trinity. It's Jesus describing how he sees God the Father and the Holy Spirit. What we know is that Jesus, in this text, is speaking to his disciples just a little while before he is killed. And he is telling them about the Holy Spirit, who will be their advocate and their comforter. Jesus tells them that the Spirit of truth will speak not what she wants to say, but what God, through the person and work of Jesus, has already been saying, that God is faithful and compassionate. God is loving and is full of mercy. And here's the tough part from this text. The Spirit speaks the truth from God, not necessarily what what we want to hear, for the Spirit is a tough comforter and a tough advocate. But what we need to hear. What Jesus is saying in the Gospel of John is that the Spirit isn't bent to our will for our own pleasure and desires, but will always be consistent with the will of God and speak God's truth. She can do no other because the Spirit is not for us to command as individuals, but is received and held in a community of faith. The Spirit is not a private possession, but the Spirit keeps the community grounded in Jesus' revelation of God, not in our individual private experience of God. That's the tough part. You have heard examples of this individual use of the Spirit, what I call non-Spirit Spirit talk. You know, the kind of talk where a person will come up to you and say, the Spirit told me that you and I are going to get married, so we better start dating right now. And you're like, I didn't get that memo from the Spirit. Right? You've heard it. Or a little more harsh, maybe, the Spirit told me not to forgive you yet, so I'm going to hang on to my anger a little bit longer. Or perhaps, you know, God told me that I shouldn't welcome you into the church because, you know, you don't really look like me, you don't dress like me, and you don't believe like I do, so I'm not going to welcome you into the church. Or perhaps a little more closer to home, Spirit told me to beat you up because you're gay, and gay people should be punished because they're sinners. This, my friends, is not truth from the Spirit because the Spirit will never, never contradict God's justice or Jesus' ministry of love and welcome because God 
cannot contradict God's self. But if the Spirit of God is not the sole possession of the individual, neither is it of Christianity. The doctrine of the Trinity not only tells us who God is, but more intimately tells us about the love of God, not just for the church and for Christians, but for all humanity everywhere. The Holy Spirit is not the exclusive possession of Christians, but the Spirit of God, whose renewing and helping sphere of influence already extends throughout all of the world. What our understanding of people of different faiths, of the world outside the church, be changed if we learned not to separate, but to connect the work of God the Son and God, the Holy Spirit, with the work of God, the Creator. As we come together to worship, as all faith faithful people everywhere gather to worship, to celebrate the one who gives us life, our coming together is forged by the Spirit. The example of the Trinity is that humans should not exist in isolation but should be in relationship. Look around you, middle church. No, look around you, middle church. You're not in isolation. This is your relationship. We witness to the Trinity by reflecting the face of God in all our relationships. In this way, the Trinity is embodied in us. The Trinity dances in us. One commentator states the concept of perichoresis allows the individuality of the persons to be maintained while insisting that each person shares in the life of the other two. An image often used to express this idea is that of a community of being in which each person, while maintaining its distinctive identity, penetrates the other and is penetrated by them. St. Augustine had a beautiful metaphor for the Trinity. He said that God was the lover, Jesus was the beloved, and the Spirit was love. God loves the Son. The Son returns the love to the Father. And the Spirit is the bond of love that unites them. This, my friends, this bond of love between the Trinity is an image of the universal community of God. And we reflect the particular spiritual community which we move and have our being. This bond between them is a dance of love, a love that knows no bounds, a love that is merciful, full of grace and truth. And this dance is then reflective of us, of who we are. We are the Trinity. We then move and have our being, and we are like God, full of love, grace, mercy, and truth, and how we should then live as one. Amen.